Good morning, everyone. Hi, Sue. It is so great to see the room full of people again. I just am excited about that. And so welcome to our first seminar for 2024. We have another great slate of topics planned for this year, and uh, we're excited to see people coming and joining us. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I'm Director of Plan Giving here in the Foundation Office at Torrance Memorial. And we're pleased to bring you this financial health series, financial health seminar series, to um, help educate uh, everyone on charitable giving and uh, financial health planning, estate planning, all of those kinds of things. And so we are happy to, to bring this to, to uh, you with the help of our professional advisory council. They are a group of volunteers who are involved in estate planning. So we have attorneys, CPAs, financial uh, planners, uh, who else? Um, professional fiduciaries, a life care manager. We have a great uh, group of folks who help to um, help, you know, keep everybody educated and then be a resource for those who might need the, the uh, professional uh, assistance of, of folks like that. And I have to also mention a couple realtors who are both actually here today and you're going to meet them pretty soon. I also want to welcome those who are on Zoom. We uh, appreciate your participating as well, and um, I want to say thank you to Mitchell from Media Services, who's back in the control booth, making sure that everything there uh, runs smoothly as well. So we, um, I want to uh, just take care of a couple housekeeping items. So if you have a cell phone with you, if you would sure to make sure that it's in silent mode, so it doesn't interrupt our presentation. The restrooms are through the doors back there to the right, so that's where you'll find those. You should have each received a door prize ticket when you came in. We have a few gift cards to give away at the end, and you do have to be present to win because we're going to call those numbers on the tickets and, uh, and have you uh, receive your gift that way. And those, the door prizes have um, uh, been donated by one of our professional advisory council members, uh, Maureen Dearden, who is a, a business uh, valuation expert. So I hope you also received the handouts when you came in. There's a power a copy of the PowerPoint. There is an evaluation form I'll talk about later and then a flyer for next month or next month, March, our next seminar in March. So we do like to hold all the questions until the end. So on the table, you'll see some index cards as the presenters are talking, if you would please um, just write, jot down your question and write, uh, you know, print it legibly for us so that we can read it and we'll handle all of the questions at the end of the seminar. So uh, Zoomers, those who are online, it, there is a chat opportunity at the bottom of the screen and that is where you can enter your questions and uh, be, and we'll, we'll get those included as much as possible. I like to usually, I always like to kind of do a poll of the audience. And so, and for those who are still coming in, there are some empty seats at the tables over here. So um, you can find a spot still over on this side of the room uh, for those who are just coming in. But how many are here for the first time to attend one of these uh, financial health seminars? Well, that's great. It's wonderful to see new faces and always good to see the familiar faces of people coming back too. So for those looking for a seat right up here in the front, second, third table over on this side, there's, there are some seats for you to, to be seated. I always like to highlight a few of the things, other things that are going on on our campus for education. On January 17, our Miracle of Living uh, lecture series, which is always about health issues, is uh, happening. The title is A Closer Look at Eye Health, and that happens at 6.30 here in this room and there's a Zoom option for that as well. And then often we get questions and suggestions on our evaluation form for Medicare 101, and we do have a, already a class about Medicare. It's offered by our Torrance Memorial IPA. It's the fourth Wednesday of every month at 6.30, and it's done on Zoom. So you can, you can find that by going to Torrance Memorial IPA and uh, look at their educational opportunities. So that is a, a good way for you to learn about how Medicare works or recommend it to someone else who is getting to that point. So we have um, our current 
campaign is to expand our emergency department. So I thought I would give you a little sneak peek at the floor plan for the second floor. What we're doing is expanding to the floor above the existing uh, emergency department. We're seeing over 100,000 patients a year in a space that in uh, 2014 saw about 65,000. So our, our emergency department team is amazing in how creative they are in trying to make this work. And um, you know they use every space possible to try and, and see patients. So it's high time for an expansion. So we will be moving up to a second floor, which will double our space and increase our capacity by, by about 76%. But this is, this is the plan here. There are a few private rooms that, and a couple in the middle there and on the end. These spaces here will have four uh, beds in them. And then we also have some, some spaces where there are chairs. And uh, the doctors say that sometimes patients who come to the ED are better, are better treated sitting up than laying down. So we have some treatment spaces for, uh, for that as well. So the process is going to include renovating the waiting area and the entrance for the, the current uh, emergency department. And, uh, and then because we have to put in a couple elevators that will bring people up to the second floor. The check-in will remain on the first floor, and that's how it will be triaged. So patients will be either sent upstairs or will continue to use the first floor. So it's, a, it's about a seven-year project, and um, this, this second floor space should be open in January of 2028. So with all of the approvals and plan checks and everything that have to happen through the state, it, it takes a while to get through it. But, we are excited about that opportunity. It's a $62 million project, and the foundation is already uh, busy raising funds for that. We made a commitment to raise $30 million over three years. We're already at $40 million, and it's been only one year. So this is a, a project that is, uh, is resonating with the community who, you know, I think there's a lot of connection to uh, emergency department um, use. And one of the tools we use to raise funds is our holiday festival. We celebrated 40 years with our festival and last December, and uh, we raised uh, about $2.2 .2 million this year with that. So it was um, very successful. It's a very festive uh, way to kick off the holiday season. So you can always look for that the week following um, Thanksgiving week. So keep that in mind for this year if you haven't been there yet. And one of the um, things we do usually is share a story with our guests at the gala. So we made a video this year where the emergency department was used and it actually is the story of one of our very own who you, who you have heard speak here many times, Stephanie Besner is one of our professional advisory council members who is uh, an attorney. So it's going to start out with a siren. I don't want you to be startled, but here's her story. My husband was working on cleaning up the Christmas decorations, and he fell off the ladder. He went head over feet, smashed his head on our garage floor. The result was massive skull fracture and brain bleeding, as well as bleeding throughout his skull. I pulled up uh, to the emergency room here, and I leapt out of the car, ran into the ER, asked for help. He came in in really a life-threatening situation, and we had to drop everything we were doing at that moment. Brian is closing his eyes and losing his words. He's pretty much at the point where he was nonverbal. I remember reaching out to all the other specialists and resources and team here at Torrance Memorial to expedite his care and get him the treatment he needed. He spent the next seven days at the Torrance Memorial Intensive Care Unit. Again, Brian was having speech therapy and physical therapy and occupational therapy each day to bring back his skills. It was incredible to see the progress that he was making and talking to his physicians. And every day you could see improvements. He was walking in a more steady fashion and it was easier for him to be able to communicate. His Incredible recovery is a tribute to how quickly he was treated, and that's really a tribute to Dr. Kennedy and his surgeon, Dr. Snyder, and all of the team here. Without the quick response of Torrance Memorial, I don't know if I'd be here today. 
Thank you to the doctors and staff and nurses and everybody who's part of the Torrance Memorial team for saving my husband's life. Were it not for Torrance Memorial, he wouldn't be here today. And I'm so thankful for that. And our daughters are thankful for that. And every single member of our family is thankful for that. When minutes count, you can count on us. So that's a powerful story. This happened in January of 2022. Brian is a teacher and he went from not knowing his children's names, not being able to recall that to back teaching and um, his, his recovery has definitely, have definitely been remarkable. And uh, we appreciate their sharing that story. So um, we've, we've told the Besner family that they, they've done their share here at the hospital and they need to stay away now. So, because Stephanie had a brain aneurysm a couple few years ago, she had surgery here. Her, her daughters were both in the NICU, and so it's like they have um, had many experiences here, and, uh, she, and Stephanie and Brian both are great ambassadors for the amazing care we're able to provide here. So, um, but I think they've done enough. So um, I mentioned I'm director of plan giving, and uh, so I've listed here some of the common types of plan gifts that are used, a bequest being the most common. We are a nonprofit hospital, and so we do need your support to help keep things going. Reimbursements from insurance and Medicare don't cover the cost, so it's really important that we have wonderful support from our community, and they have been very generous with us, so we, we appreciate that. I wanted to hi, uh, highlight one of the things is a charitable gift annuity and uh, the rates uh, recently went up and so effective January 1st. And so this is an opportunity for you to receive income for the rest of your life and also do something good with it. So after you're gone, whatever's left in your annuity comes to Torrance Memorial. And there you can see here the, the different rates that apply at various years, 75, 78 and 80. This would be your, um, your in annual income is listed here. This is the charitable deduction you get when you set it up. And then at the bottom here, part of the income you receive is tax-free. So for a period of time. So that, that is kind of an overview of what is available for that. It's a, a great way to um, generate some income and uh, it can be for any amount typically up to 100,000 is what what we'll do here so if you have questions about that please uh, let me know and uh, I'd be happy to do an illustration for you and uh, you know talk through that process with you so we have also a heritage society it's our group of people who have included us in their estate plan and anyone who uh, creates one of these gifts is included in that. We also, um, Brandon and Carol are gonna talk about the IRA qualified charitable distributions. And we consider an IRA part of your estate plan. So we do include anybody who does that in our heritage society too. So just a, a little tip on that. So uh, some resources for plan giving are listed here. Uh, there's a, a free estate planning kit you can download from this site that's listed at the top of the screen. It is a great way to bring together all of your assets into one record book is what, how it's listed. And then there's a lesson book that comes with it as well. So you can um, download that, or if you have difficulty downloading it, my phone number and email are there. Just let me know and I'd be happy to send it to you. So um, I mentioned we're a nonprofit hospital. Here are some ways to donate to us to help support our current project of, of uh, expanding our emergency department. So we appreciate whatever support you can give. I'm now gonna turn it over to our uh, co-chair, Karen Pryor. She shares that role with our new co-chair, Betty Tsai Bergman, who isn't here today. She's an attorney. We do a, a rolling kind of service as co-chair. So Karen is a uh, certified reverse mortgage special specialist with Mutual of Home, I can't speak. I've lost my, my words. Mutual of Omaha reverse Mortgage Division. Let's welcome Karen. She's going to introduce our presenters. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Uh, I get to read the fun part. Um, this material 
is for general information only and is not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals, and there are many on the Advisory Council. Uh, could I have uh, the members of the, the PAC come up front here so we can introduce you? Abby and Tom and Matthew. Thank you for, that's, that's good. Thank you for helping out this morning. Matthew Moore, Matt is a licensed real estate broker specializing in real estate matters related to estates, trusts, and conservatorships. He also provides property management services. Thank you, Matt, for coming today. Uh, Tom Schlapafa is a certified financial planner with Morgan Stanley here in Torrance. Thanks for coming, Tom. And Abby Waddell is a licensed real estate agent with Compass and holds the designations of senior real estate specialist, probate specialist, and certified relocation and transition specialist. Thank you, Abby, for coming. Okay, today's workshop is on individual taxation. Yeah, let's give them a hand, round of applause for showing up on Saturday morning. Uh, today's uh, workshop, individual taxation, wrapping up 2023 and planning for 2024. We have two speakers here with us today. Uh, the first, Brandon Holmes, is a CPA and part owner of Medical Accounting Service, Inc., which specializes in accounting for medical and dental practices, their professionals, and families. Brandon earned a bachelor and master's degree in engineering at MIT and a master of taxation degree at USC. Right on. He served in the U.S. Army for eight years after college, where he was a ranger stationed primarily in Asia. He then worked in several engineering and management positions until transitioning over to accounting full-time in 2016. At Torrance Memorial, Brandon serves on the YPPA committee and this professional advisory council. Welcome, Brandon. Carol Kalinkovich has over 25 years experience in public accounting and has worked with privately held companies and their owners in a variety of industries. Part of Carol's focus is working as a team with her clients and their business advisors to develop integrated, cohesive plans for the most cost-effective approach to achieving the client's short and long-term goals. She also works with family groups, which may include multi-tiered and consolidated entities, as well as multiple generations. Carol's specializations include comprehensive tax planning and compliance for individuals and their closely held entities, multi-state taxation issues, and succession and estate planning. Carol is a graduate of the USC, slide on again, with a Bachelor of Science in Accounting and a Master of Taxation from Golden Gate University. She currently serves on the Board of Directors of the South Bay Children's Health Center and has sat on the board of several not-for-profit charitable organizations. You're in for a treat this morning. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I am so impressed that so many of you are so interested in tax. <laughs> All right. So let's see. Hang on. Okay. So we always start with New Year's resolutions in January, right? So these are some new New Year's resolutions that you can consider. I will pay attention to mail that refers to important tax information and deal with notices immediately. So a lot of people tend to get this letter from the IRS or the Franchise Tax Board. They panic. They're like, I'll deal with it later, or they throw it in the mail. They wait for another one to come. I have many clients. I'm like, didn't you get like letters before this one? They're like, yeah, but I didn't think it was that important. So make sure that you are reading your mail and you know talking to someone about them. I will keep good records. I'm sure all of you, by being so disciplined and being here this morning, keep good records. I will not believe everything on the internet, including chat GPT. So we know there's a lot going on right now with artificial intelligence and you know people, it's just crazy what's going on there right now. So you know it's okay to look stuff up, we all do, but always make sure that you're consulting with a professional. I will listen to my friends and family cautiously. So again, we always hear things like, oh, you're paying tax? I saved $1,000 doing this or that. You don't want to do that, right? Or you want to make sure, again, that you're dealing with some professionals. 
This one's really important. I will not open emails or attachments or answer phone calls and provide information if I'm not 100% certain who it is. Again, there's so much scamming and phishing and all of this identity breach that's going on right now. I had a client who got a phone call from someone. They knew her grandson's name, first and last name, you know, said that he's in trouble in Mexico and we really need, you know, some, you really need to send some money. She sent, I believe it was $10,000 never got it back, never was able to trace the person. So, you know, please be careful because they are able to find a lot of personal information about you. So watch out for those phone calls. And then the last one, I will ask for help when needed. You know, we all need help from people. So don't be afraid to ask for help. All right. Um, one thing I did want to mention that's not on the agenda is, as you probably know, there's a potential government shutdown again. Um, I believe January 19th is the first potential date, which is next week. I guess Congress is trying to avoid that. And then the, the more important one is February 2nd. And if there is a shutdown, that's when the IRS would be affected. So just kind of watch out in the news for that, because if the IRS is affected, then obviously, you know, tax filings may be affected. Being able to contact the IRS may be affected. All right, so this is the brief agenda that we're going to go through. Um, you know, we'll go through it. We won't get in too much detail. We don't want to bore you. We want to make sure you stay awake. So we'll go through all of this together. All right, common myths. If I don't receive a W-2 or 1099, the income is not reportable. Obviously, as taxpayers, we're required to report all the income that we receive, whether or not we receive a form for it. Filing a paper return is the most secure way to file my taxes. Again, you know, hopefully most of you are electronically filing your returns. The IRS has a service and, you know, most uh, tax professionals have a service. And this is really a more secure way to do it. Um, again, I had an experience with a client who was making some tax payments and they were like, I really don't want to do it electronically. I'm going to mail the checks. So they mailed the checks. It got lost. Um, you know, your social security number and everything's on there. And, you know, they never found it. Luckily, it doesn't seem like they, you know, got the money was stolen or anything, but it's scary because now, you know, the social security number is on the check somewhere. Um, I can claim my pets as dependents. It's, um, it's funny how many clients still ask me that. <laughs> uh, monetary gifts I receive are taxable and gifts I give to family and friends are deductible as a donation. So gifts are gifts. When you receive them, they're not taxable. When you donate, or not, I shouldn't say donate, when you give them to family members or friends, you don't get a deduction for it. It's a pure gift. I can deduct what I would have received as rent as a donation when I donate my vacation home time to a charity. So I get this question a lot. People think that if they donate their timeshare or their vacation home, the, the rent that they lose by not collecting rent, they get to deduct as a donation. That is absolutely not true. Um, if you think about it, you're not getting the rent, so you're not reporting as income, so you're not really giving anything up. You can deduct the costs associated with it while you're donating it. So if there's some utilities that you're paying or some insurance or what have you, that can be deducted, but the actual quote lost rent is not deductible. Filing taxes is voluntary, and as we all know, that's not true. All right, so, so the good thing about this past year, for the most part, it's been pretty quiet on the tax front. Um, <clears throat> in 2020, at the end of 2025, things might change quite a bit, but you probably all heard this even from last year. The highest tax bracket is still 37% for anyone. And for high income folks, 37% is their marginal rate, which means that each additional dollar that they earn or is, that is taxable is gonna be taxed at the 37% rate. The effective tax rate is the average tax rate and there still is a marriage penalty. So as you can see, the marriage penalty only hits at the 37%. And what the marriage penalty is, is if you can see, if you're single, um, can't, I can't see that far. If you're single, over 578,000 is at the 37%. But if you're married finally jointly, it's over 693,000. 
So it's not double of the 578,000. Whereas you can see at the lower rates, 231, double of that is 462. So there's no marriage penalty. So it's only when you hit the highest tax bracket. So this is just a reference for your 2023 and 2024 uh, tax tables. I have some examples here. Um, I'm really not going to go through them. You can refer to them later. It's just basically how the taxes are calculated. California taxes, obviously it works the same way. It's a, it's a progressive, as you make more money, the money is taxed at the highest rate or is taxed at the higher rate. Um, the tax rates, so this is a little deceiving. I, I put here tax rates are going as high as 14.4%. The highest bracket is at 13.3%, but the additional 1.1% is for those that have wages. The state disability um, rate is at 1.1%. And it's kind of like Social Security, right? Social Security, once you hit a certain level of income, you're no, you, you reach the max and you're not taxed additional. For the state disability, starting in 2024, there is no limit. So you're taxed on 1.1% if you make a million dollars, if you make a dollar. So um, that's why it says 14.4. But it's really, as you'll see here, the highest rate is the 12.3% but there's an additional 1% mental health service tax if you have taxable income over a million dollars. Alternative minimum tax, I'm sure you've all heard of it before. It hasn't been as applicable over the last few years because in 2017, they changed it quite a bit. What alternative minimum tax is, is a separate tax calculation, which allows um, which disallows certain deductions. And it's basically just another way to calculate tax. But again, starting in 2018, the calculations changed quite a bit and the floors of the, of the type of income changed quite a bit. So a lot of people don't fall into that bef anymore. Um, the clients that I see that it most applies to are those with incentive stock, stock options that they exercise. Federal estate gift and gift taxes. So as you probably all know, for 2024, the lifetime exemption is $13.6 million, double for married couples. Basically, that means that anyone who passes away this year can die with $13.61 million and not have to pay any estate taxes. That, as um, many of you know, at the end of 2025 is set to expire. So, um, you know, I know that, and I know we have state attorneys in our group, and I'm sure we'll have future topics about that for planning. The annual tax free gift for 2024 is 18,000. For 2023, it was 17,000. And again, what that means is that you can gift to any one person $18,000 and not have to file a gift tax return, not have to report it anywhere. Again, it's not deductible and the person doesn't report it as income. So it's just a gift. So a lot of people will give um, these gifts to their family members or maybe even a friend. Um, and it, again, it's not taxable and it's not deductible. And you can give, so, you know, as a couple, if you're married, you as a couple can give 18,000 each. And so I have a lot of clients that give to their daughter, their son-in-law, grandkid number one, two, and three. So you know, that's just a way that they can give money to and again, not have to file any tax of, type of tax returns. So again, just a big list of all the different sources of income. You know, wages, obviously 1099, any type of income. If you have rental property, royalties, I know how some people have still have oil wells somehow connected in Texas. Um, Retirement plan distributions, so any distributions from your IRAs, from your 401k, all of that, you go, you'll get a 1099-R form. Social Security, 
So Social Security is taxable up to 85% of the income can be taxable, depending on what tax bracket you're in. Um, investment income, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the interest, dividends, capital gains, etc. cetera. Uh, crowdfunding, I'm not gonna really go through that. Any gifts with an attachment to it, so not a pure gift. Legal settlements, um, I'll go to a, a quick case about that. Tax refund can be taxable if you were able to deduct it. Um, again, because of the limitations, not, it's not as applicable anymore. Gambling winning, winnings in excess of losses. So, you know, that's a little tricky one. So gambling winnings, you'll get a 1099 and um, you have to report it as income. You can report the losses to the extent of the earnings, but they become part of your itemized deduction. So if you're not itemizing deductions, then it won't offset. If you're taking that standard deduction instead of the itemized deductions, you're going you're gonna to see that all of your gambling winnings are taxable. Um, and I apologize because this case might have been here last year. I don't, um, but basically, it's just a, a pretty simple case where there was a husband and wife filing a joint return. Um, she had wages, he had a sole proprietor and had some um, income as an independent contractor. He didn't report his income. Um, the wife tried to request innocent spouse relief saying she didn't know about it and that she thought her husband's um, income was gifts from the, her mother-in-law. The, the court basically denied it and said, you know, a reasonable person would have known. So, um, you know, claiming the innocent spouse relief has to be much more robust than that. You can't just say, well, I didn't know. Okay, exclusions from income. So I, I mentioned it several times. Gifts and inheritances, well, gifts are excludable. Inheritance, inheritances are also excludable unless it's income with respect to the decedent. So it depends on the type of income or inheritance that you get. Life insurance premiums are excluded from income. Disaster relief payments, there's been a lot of that lately. <clears throat> um, income, that rental income that was for 14 days or less. So I saw that a lot, not as much anymore, but I saw that a lot where um, uh, TV or movie companies were, you know, just like renting a house for 10 days or a parking lot or what have you for less than 14 days. So those that income is excludable. So you might still get a 1099, but there is a um, exception that you would report on the tax return to say it's excludable. Tax free muni bonds. Um, again, you have to check with your state what the requirements are, but basically that's generally excludable. Um, and then public welfare benefits and physical injury legal sentiments. So this is the case I mentioned. Um, basically, it was a case where uh, there was a groundskeeper. This was re with regard to uh, Roundup, and there was like some pesticides or herbicides that he um, was using quite a bit, and he got uh, lymphoma. Basically, he got a settlement of $39 million in physical injury and $250 million in punitive damages. The $250 million in punitive damages is always taxable. The, the amount related to physical injury is not taxable. So it sounds great, $289 million of a settlement that he received. However, as we know, the attorneys take probably a good half, you know, 50% of that. And then with the remaining 250, uh, with, with the tax on the 250, basically there's about a $100 million tax bill for federal and 20 million for California. So he ends up with only $25 million roughly of about the $289, $289 million of, for the settlement. So again, because half of it went to the attorneys and the you know good chunk of it went to taxes. He's really not left with much. So, you know, we all hear these big you know settlement claims. It's on TV all the time. All these uh, you know PI attorneys and whatnot. So, just be careful if you do enter into any type of um, relationship with a attorney or you know settlement type of thing that you're just knowing the whole picture, um, because again, advertisements and commercials are crazy. 
Social Security and Retirement Income. So basically, um, oops, sorry. Required min minimum distribution. So as many of you know, you have to take the required, min required minimum distribution, what's commonly known as RMD, once you hit a certain age. And so that's a distribution from your retirement accounts, whether it's an IRA or a 401k or a pension plan, you have to take a distribution. And basically there's a calculation that you do based on the value of the account to determine how much needs to be withdrawn. So the rules changed, I think it was a couple of years ago, um, and they increased the age. So this year, if you turned 73 in 2023, you must start taking your RMD. If you're born after 1958, you must start taking your RMD at age 75. So basically they're delaying it for people that you know, don't need the funds to delay taking it out so that it can continue to invest. And as um, Sandy mentioned, and I think we'll, uh, Brian might go more in depth about it as well. And I know a little plug for our March 9th um, webinar or seminar, uh, they'll, talk, they'll definitely talk about it more in depth with regard to retirement planning and um, RMDs, but basically qualified charitable distributions, which is called QCDs. Basically, if you don't need the funds from your retirement, you can take that money and donate it directly to a charity. And that's really important, again, because if you don't itemize deductions, right? So if you take the standard deduction in, it, instead, you know, you, your mortgage is paid off, your taxes are limited to $10,000, and the standard deduction is, you know, well over $25,000 now. So if you don't have enough to itemize and take the standard deductions, you, you, you won't get the benefit of your donations if it's not over that standard deduction. So a lot of my clients that are retired, what they do is they take their requirement minimum distribution and, and they don't have to do all of it. So let's just say their RMD is $50,000. They'll say, okay, $10,000, I'm gonna di direct it to charity. And so now they're only taxed on the 40,000 instead of the whole 50,000. And it's important because they would have donated the $10,000 anyway and not get the benefit of that deduction. So it's a really good vehicle for um, saving some taxes and still being philanthropic. And, and you can do up to 100,000 for 2023. For 2024, they finally um, are increasing it for inflation purposes. So it's up to 105,000 beginning in 2024. Um, there is one thing that's very important because I do get this question a lot. You cannot designate it to a donor advised fund. So a donor advised fund is those funds that you set up. You don't know exactly what charities you want to contribute to yet. And so you set up a donor advised fund with a financial advisor. It has to be to a specific charity. And it can't be to um, a private foundation. The other thing that's really important too um, is that you let your tax preparer know if you did do a qualified charitable distribution. I don't know why the IRS hasn't fixed the forms yet. I mean, it's been quite a few years already, but there's nothing on that 1099-R form that shows your distribution. There's nothing on that form to indicate if you did anything to the charities. So you need to let them know because um, your, your 1099 will just show, let's just say again, the $50,000, but your tax preparer won't know that you did the $10,000 as a QCD unless you tell them. So that's really important. I've actually had to amend some tax returns because you know, after, after the returns were filed, they said, oh, I forgot to tell you, or you know, why, why was my income so high? Okay, Secure Act 2.0, this passed a couple years ago, but a lot of it affects um, taxes in 2023 and 2024. The penalties for, not, for failing to take the RMD, so, you, so you're required to take it out at a certain age, and if you don't take it out, the penalties used to be 50%. That has now been reduced to 25%. Um, quite honestly, I haven't, 
for the most part, I think you can um, argue that, you know, for reasonable cause you didn't know or, you know, what have you to at least get a first time penalty waiver, because um, it's quite a severe penalty, as you can see. Um, in 2024, if you have an employer Roth account, you no longer have to make a minimum distribution. Uh, again, the rules change all of this because of Secure Act 2.0. If you inherit an IRA, generally the entire balance must be distributed within 10 years of the date of death. And that's quite a shock to most people because a lot of times, again, they inherit an IRA and they want it to continue to grow if they don't need the money, you know, and they're younger, they just want it to grow. But now generally the, um, there's a lot of caveats to this rule, but generally you have to take most of the money out within the 10 years. And if the decedent was already taking minimum distributions, you also have to take the minimum distributions as well. So there's a lot of complications with the rule, but that's general, the general rule. Um, starting in 2024, employers can match employee student loan payments with the matching payments to the retirement account. And then 529 plans. So maybe a lot of your kids have set up uh, 529 plans, which is uh, education plans for their for your grandkids. Basically, if the beneficiary of that plan, so the kids or the grandkids can roll that over into a Roth if they don't need that for their education. Social Security, so you, you know, for those of you that qualify, you probably already all got your little notices of your increase in the Social Security. Um, not as exciting this year as it was the last two years. Last year, you got an increase of 8.7%. 2022 is 5.9%. This year, it's only 3.2%. Um, and again, basically, up to 85% of that income can be taxable, depending on your orders, other sources of income. Um, I know, I believe, yeah, the, the Torrance Memorial also has um, webinar seminars about Social Security and trying to figure out, because it is quite a complicated situation now with Social Security and Medicare, but basically, you know, you want to decide when you, when you want to start taking it out. Um, you can start taking it out at 62, but you get some reduced benefits. You're eligible for Medicare at 65 and you get the full insurance amount at age 67. If you delay it to age 70, then you get you know, even more than the full amount. And this kind of just talks in more detail about what I just mentioned. And then the Medicare insurance premiums, you know, again, that is based on your level of income. And so the more money you make, the more you pay for your Medicare benefits for Part B and Part D. Um, IRA contributions, if you're still making IRA contributions, the limit is $6,500 for 2023 and 7,000 in 2024. If you're over 50, there's a $1,000 catch up that you can make and you have until um, April 15th to make that contribution for 2023 year. You have to have income to make that contribution. Um, backdoor Roth conversions are still available. And again, what that is, is most people, if you're over a certain income level, you can't make a Roth contribution. And I'll, I'll just go briefly, I'm, I think most of you know what Roth IRAs are, but basically Roth accounts is where the, you don't get a deduction for when you contribute to that retirement account, the money continues to grow, and when you take it out, it's not taxable. So it's a great benefit, but there's a lot of um, limitations on who can make that contribution because of your income. So basically what this backdoor Roth conversion is, is you can make a non-deductible IRA contribution. So basically anybody can do that. You just, um, it's not deductible. And then a few months later, or whenever you decide with your financial advisor, you convert that to a Roth. 
and the only item that would be taxable was would be the income earned on that. So let's just say you made a $6,500 non-deductible IRA contribution for 2023 in April. In September, and, and it's invested in a very low earning money market, you know, 1%. Um, and make, you make that in April, then in September, you decide, okay, I'm gonna convert that to a Roth. So you can do that, and the only tax you would pay would be the earnings on that for the four months that it was still in the non-deductible IRA. So a lot of people do this, and when you do that, then it becomes a Roth, and then it continues to grow tax-free. Now, the thing about it is, if you have other IRA accounts, then you have to aggregate them all together. So um, again, you know, consult with something if you're considering this. Capital gains and dividends. So basically, capital gain rates have not changed. Um, you see it here. You know, there is a situation if it's you're a low earner that it's taxed at zero percent or uh, fifteen percent. Um, Twenty percent is the highest capital gain rate. There's an additional three point eight percent, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But basically, if you have qualified dividends, which a lot of you do from your investments, then that is taxed at the lower rate if that's considered capital gains. And California, a lot of people still uh, don't know this, California does not have a special capital gains rate. Capital losses, as you know, losses are netted against the capital gains. So if you have losses in excess of your gains, you are allowed to take $3,000 on your tax return and the remainder carry forward. So a common uh, phrase that financial advisors use talk about harvesting losses. And what that means is that they're building up some of the losses that might be in people's investment accounts for the potential of some gains in the future. So you never lose these losses. They just, again, you, you get to take $3,000 net per year and it carries over each year. Um, I added in here non-business bad debt loss. So a non-business bad debt loss, if you have this, becomes a short-term capital loss. And that would be like if you loaned someone money and they never paid you back, right? But you have to have some evidence of this. So you have to have like a note that you had with them, um, you know, with like a, you know, with interest and kind of, you know, the terms of it. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, but there has to be some evidence that this was a legitimate uh, loan and it wasn't a gift. So, you know, you might have some friends that say, hey, I want to do this. Can you loan me some money? You know, hopefully you have um, some evidence that it was loaned. And then you have to prove that you tried to collect it, right? Either that person went bankrupt or, you know, you pursued them through emails and mail and all that. So then you can, you can take it as a non-business bad debt loss, again, which is a short-term capital loss. Okay, additional 3.8% surtax on net investment income. So I'm sure a lot of you see this. It's just an additional tax of 3.8% on all of your investments. And it's all of those what they call passive investments, interest, dividends, rental income, capital gains, you know, anything that is passive. And so a lot of people are really shocked when they see this and, you know, and they feel the pain. And as you can see, there's a, there's a floor. So it's only if your gross income is, is over 200,000 for single, 250,000 for um, married filing joint. And so again, this is a kind of an evidence of a, another type of marriage penalty because that married filing joint should really be 400,000, but it's not. So um, the married filing joint people are hit harder or quicker on this investment income tax. So again, net investment income tax is on passive income or investment income. It's not on your you know, wages, your trade or business type of income. 
um, it's not on anything that's tax exempt. The big one that people are surprised about is they sell their home, right? And if you've had your home for many, many years, you sell it, you know, you, you get your $500,000 exclusion if you're married, finally joint, or $250,000 if you're single. But even after that, there's still some taxable capital gains to report. Unfortunately, you have to pay the additional 3.8% tax on that as well. So I have clients that, you know, we do calculations, they're thinking about selling their home because it's appreciated so much. They've done some improvements, but not nearly enough to cover the huge capital gains that they're going to have. And they're always surprised by this additional 3.8% that they have to pay in addition to the regular 20% of capital gains. Um, when, this when this law was, you know, being uh, written and constructed, they were really was trying to make a strong push to exclude it on the residences, but it didn't happen, obviously. Um, the income is reduced by some expenses, but it's very minimal. Okay, foreign reporting. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, I don't have any foreign investments, I don't have to report anything. Well, that may or may not be true. So a lot of um, people don't realize that if you have any signatory responsibilities on foreign bank accounts, so you know, business execs, they may not own the account, but they have some signature authority on it, they need to report it um, on their tax return. So there's, there's a form 114, which you report it on, and it's about the foreign bank accounts and you need the information on it. If you have foreign accounts that are over $10,000 in, you know, any country, you also need to report it. And I think you know it's important to know to not be scared about it. It's just really reporting about it, and you do have to give your account number and the balance. Um, but it's better to report it than not report it. And um, the other important thing to remember is it's at any time during the year. So a lot of clients will tell me, "Well, the balance was five thousand dollars at the end of the year." I'm like, "Well, what was the balance throughout the year?" And we have to look at the average. And if it was over ten thousand dollars, then we report it. But again, it's just a reporting purpose. It's nothing that you're going to be, you know, get in trouble for. Or you have to uh, report any, any, anything else about it. And the reason I say it's important to do because the penalties are quite severe. So fifteen thousand for non-willful failure, and then if it's intentional, you know, it could be up to fifty percent of the balance. Um, there was a Supreme Court case that the penalties imposed on on it per return and not per, per account. So if you have several um, foreign accounts, it's not per account, it's just per the return. And then there was a tax case where the taxpayer was able to use the tax treaties between US, US and Mexico to avoid the $100,000 of penalties. So, you know, so all of these rules, it's just, um, important to be aware of them. There might be some outs or some exceptions or caveats, but again, don't ignore the rules, I guess, and just uh, talk to, again to the professionals. Um, so here's an, a really brief example. Uh, Rico is a US citizen. His brother Pete maintains the bank accounts in Mexico. Um, the account are in Pete's name, but but Pete only accesses the account upon Rico, who's a US citizen's instructions. So Rico is considered to have a financial interest for the fi financial reporting purposes. If Pete, who lives in Mexico, is a US citizen or resident, he also has to report the same accounts under him. So I have a client that you know, has an account in France and it's her mom's account and same thing, kind of the same story. She said, well, you know, it's really just, I'm just doing it because it's my mom and I take care of everything. I'm like, well, you still do need to report it, even though it's not technically your funds. All right. And with that said, I turn it over to my wonderful colleague, Brandon. Hi. 
Okay, on federal credits, there are quite a few of them, and a lot of them are restricted by your AGI or adjusted gross income, so they diminish as you make more money. But the credits, the, the ones we commonly see, uh, child and dependent care credits, um, those are a few grand. Adoption is huge. That is AGI restricted though, and it never covers the cost of an adoption. Uh, adoptions are quite costly if you've ever gone through one. Uh, you got some premium tax credits and earned income tax credits uh, for low income. These are a high point of audit as well. Uh, so you just gotta be cautious on claiming these credits and to work with a professional if you do. Um, there are some educational credits, which you tend to see for kids who kind of go off on their own where it comes into play. Or if you go back to college and your AGI is quite low during those periods, we'll see those come into play as well. Um, and then foreign tax credits. Basically, if you pay taxes out of this country, you get credit for it here. Um, same thing for paying state taxes out of California, you get credit in here unless there's some type of nexus and some adjustment, which makes it more complicated. Um, uh oh, how do I do this? Sorry, it's been a while. Inflation Reduction Act. This was a big act to reduce admissions across the board throughout the US. And this is federal only. California doesn't have a lot of these credits, so, um, or any credits for that matter, unfortunately. Uh, the clean vehicle credit, uh, we still had this extended. This was a prior law um, and it got boosted again, but it is AGI restricted and it's also restricted by the cost of the vehicle. So last year you saw like Tesla, they reduced the cost of their vehicles across the board, became a, quite a bit more competitive and you saw Ford and GM and everyone else kind of following suit. This along with just staying competitive in the marketplace was a big driver for that to make sure that people still came in and bought electric vehicles. Right now you see a surplus of electric vehicles. I think I saw Hertz trying to sell like 20 or 30,000 in the news. Um, it's because the high income individuals just don't qualify anymore who are a big market for these vehicles. Um, and so they might try to figure it out, might adjust this rule, we'll see. Um, the big one on this one is you're limited to two electric vehicles per year, just in case you want to buy one for you and your wife, and you have to keep the vehicle at least 30 days, so you can't be constantly turning these things over. Um, home energy credit, this one got a revival, which is nice. It used to be a lifetime credit of $500, which kind of, you know, went like that. It was really easy to pay for, to get that credit. Um, now it's a yearly annual credit up to 1200 bucks and you can even apply $150 to a home energy audit, which are typically free anyway, if you just ask your um, energy company. Um, but you can apply some of that to your tax return. Uh, you can also have an additional $2,000. I mean, very few people actually have heat pumps here. I think I had one client in California have it this year in LA. Uh, biomass stoves, I just never see anymore, uh, to be honest. Um, solar, that is still in play, 30% credit, um, which is huge, but check because the solar rule changed on the reimbursement amount uh, per uh, kilowatt that you generate, and that changed in April of 2023, and California shifted it more toward incentivizing storage versus, you know, like battery storage in your house versus just straight up solar. So look at those quotes and look at the credit and compare the two to see if it is worth it because the batteries are quite expensive. Um, and so it takes a normal solar system on a house is like 30, 40,000. So that's not cheap to start with. You add on battery storage for a two, 3,000 square foot house and it goes up to 70, 80,000. So you have to really look at the value of that system and if it is worth it and just play the two scenarios across each other. Uh, this is itemized versus standard deduction. Um, I believe the standard deduction is 25, 26,000 uh, plus this year for married filing joint and about half that for single, um, 18, 19,000 for head of household. Uh, but for flipping over to the itemized deductions, typically we don't see that occur unless you have a lot of medical and dental expenses above seven and a half percent of your AGI is when it starts kicking in. 
um, or you have a mortgage. Mortgage interest really pushes you up and then you can use some of those charitable donations like Carol said is why a lot of people use the qualified charitable donation uh, deduction because then if you're on a standard deduction limit, you can still use that charitable donation, even if you're in the standard bracket. Um, some other items that are deductible ever since the 2017 tax code, a lot of these things became more difficult, I would say, to apply, especially miscellaneous, um, where it just applies to California now. Uh, but you have DMVs, you have gambling losses to offset gains, you have investment interest income like margin accounts or using equity lines or things like that to invest in other investments to offset interest income. Um, casualty and theft losses, be careful on this because it only applies to declared disaster, federal disaster areas. So the California or the Palos Verdes landslide does not apply if you are unfortunate in that situation. Uh, but last year with all the rain that came into play for California and I'm sure a lot of you uh, remember or at least I I remember that quite well where they kept pushing off the tax code because apparently California was underwater for at least six months and we couldn't do tax returns so that was interesting um, but the key on this one also I got this question two days ago you can't take both itemized and standard deduction if you're married and you decide to split your return. Um, it, it, for some reason I, I see this error a lot with a lot of returns that I audit and I don't understand how you could do it anyway and not get flagged by the IRS, but if you're married you both take a standard or you both take an itemized. If you split, you can't both take what's more advantageous to you. It has to be parallel. Um, so it's either one or the other. Uh, medical expense. So seven and a half percent of your AGI threshold to become deductible and part of that standard deduction. Um, we're leaving out the whole corporations. Um, if you have a corporation, that's another topic that we're not going to go over but they tend to include anything that either applies to premiums, co-pays, um, or anything with prescription from your physician. You can't take anything for general health, cosmetic, gym membership, maintaining your health, unless it's, you have a doctor's support on it. Um, you can take some long-term premiums and the retirement communities, if you are moving into a retirement community or uh, care center, or if you hire someone uh, at home to help you, uh, that's when this deduction really comes into play. Uh, for things like in-home pools, saunas, you know, all the things that we'd love to deduct, but it's a really big stretch, um, go to this link and it's in your handouts. Um, this is the IRS's uh, you know, frequently asked questions on all these areas. So you can go there and see, okay, I got this scenario. Do I have a shot at it? Maybe, maybe not. Just you have to look at a case by case scenario and look at the facts. Uh, part of the other deductions is in 2017, the federal deduction was limited on salt to $10,000. Uh, that's for property, local taxes and income taxes that you pay for the state. And there have been workarounds to get you know, over this limit of $10,000 as if you have a pass through entity like an LLC that's not disregarded or an S Corp or things like that, but that's only if you own a business. Otherwise, everyone else is uh, limited to 10K. Um, you may see this if you have um, like K1s for alternative investments like into real estate or things like that. You may see this credit come into play on your K1 on your California K-1. And so something to pay attention to if you're trying, if you're doing your taxes on your own is that you'll see these little credits to get around the SALT tax. Uh, qualified residence interest, um, residence interest is limited to 750 for married filing joint. Um, it used to be a million or 1.1 for California. It still is 1.1 for California. Applies to primary and secondary residences. And you, we have seen a lot of audits on this. It's typically automated where since the interest rates were so low for so long that a lot of people locked in their mortgage at like two to 
And so if they're trying to claim too much interest, the IRS will automatically audit you and be like, this looks way too much compared to what it should be. Um, and they just have a background calculator. I'm not honest. I don't know what the threshold is, but just be aware that this is a calculation that your computer does where you have to enter the threshold and you have to know what threshold to take according to when you purchase the house. Um, the Voss case, we, brought, we bring this up each year, but this is for a couple that was not married and they had a house together. Their deduction is double because they're not married and they own this house together. And so it's a way to get from 1 million up to 2 million, 2.2 .2 in California now on the deduction. However, once they get married, that drops down to one. And so I had a couple that was trying to do this a couple of years ago, got married in December, it dropped in half and they just were completely unaware because their accountant didn't um, let them know, but they did everything in terms of deeding the property correctly. They just forgot that this was a really big marriage penalty that the, the court actually said this, we know this is a marriage penalty, we're sorry, but this is how it goes. Uh, charitable donations, uh, we pretty much um, touched on this completely. And, but the QCD is a good way to, you know, channel some of your RMD into a charity that you prefer, doesn't apply to private foundations. And that limit is rising for inflation finally to 105. One thing about the new SECURE Act, which we haven't covered, and I'm actually gonna try this with a client this year finally, um, is that 50,000 can be applied to a gift annuity. And so it's, it's actually, that's a way to get some income to you in retirement years as well and get a deduction for charity. It's not the full 50,000 that you'll get as a charitable donation. It's usually like 20 or 30 based on the principal that you receive. I mean, it is an investment when you think about it or a loan to a charitable organization where you get income over the years. Um, but it's a nice mechanism and you can use your RMD for about 50,000 for your lifetime. Uh, for charity, so they are restricted on the deduction amount, uh, 50, 30, 20%. Almost everyone is you know, looking at that 50% category for 501Cs. And it can be carried over if you accidentally over contribute. Uh, documentation is critical here. We have been through so many audits on charitable donations. Um, that's probably our most popular audit actually, where you need a letter from the charity by the time you file on any donations that you give um, with a disclaimer that no goods and services were received in, um, in exchange for this donation. You need that letter dated from the charity by the time you file. Um, if you don't have the letter, we have been through audits where we had the charity brought in to the audit. They would show the cash transfer. They would show the credit card receipts. Everything doesn't matter. IRS doesn't care. They want that letter. Um, so some of the things on charitable contributions of what you'll need in terms of how much you give, if you are giving a substantial amount, like over $5,000, that's when you need an appraisal in play and you need to be really complete on that submittal. And that's when you definitely need a professional. We have been through some of these audits where like one of our taxpayers gave a building um, to charity. And so that one, the, the appraisal actually went under audit and the sticking point was the amount of signatures by the appraiser did not match the tax form because the tax form only had one, um, one slot for a signature, but there were two appraisers. So both appraisers could not sign the tax form and the IRS was about to kick the entire thing out because both signatures were not on the IRS form. I mean, that's how nitpicky this was. And we eventually got the credit for the taxpayer, but they are really on these large donations. They see so much fraud across the board that they stick black and white to the T on contributions on, on the big stuff. The small stuff, they just want to see the letters if you're under audit. Um, these are some tax court cases to kind of show you some examples of 
you know, documentation of charitable donations, but the first one, a church pastor was denied all his donations because he generated receipts and letters after the fact, after he turned in his tax return. So the IRS nixed the entire amount. Albrick, um, more recent one, same thing, document or donated 120 Native American artifacts and jewelry and very expensive items. But that's going back to that form I said, when you, when you give over $5,000, especially in terms of goods, you really need to well document it, get the appraisal, um, fill out the form that has like 21 steps or so. It's pretty a severe form. Um, and the entire thing was denied. Uh, so it's, and she tried to claim, I believe on this one, she tried to claim that her accountant didn't really know how to produce the form well enough to make sure that it was properly documented. And that doesn't go very far in terms of a tax court case. Uh, this is kind of fun. Every year, the IRS puts out the dirty dozen, which are scams to look out for. Um, they also have like the top 10 court cases or settlements as well, if you're really interested. They're, they're pretty entertaining what some people do. Um, employee retention credit claims, that was probably the biggest one, as well as the PPP loan from COVID. You're seeing a lot of court cases in the news now of taxpayers getting audited and thrown in jail because they were fraudulently filling out all these forms. I think almost all of our small businesses were approached by, you know, two or three companies about an employee retention tax credit that they qualified for um, without, you know, seeing their financials or their situation. Um, there was a lot of money out there and unfortunately a lot of people got pulled into this and now they're, that's why the IRS last year announced, you know, you can give back the money, no questions asked, um, which was actually a really good thing for them to do. Uh, you have like phishing that's related to mail, email, trying to get your passwords and money and things like that. Um, a lot of online items and fake false credits, fake charities. Um, unscrupulous tax preparers, I haven't seen that one yet, but apparently there are these ghost preparers somewhere in the ether. Dark, I don't, but they're, they're doing stuff. Um, but every once in a while, we'll have a client um, they'll find out by filing their tax return that someone else filed their tax return on their behalf using their social security number. It's a mess, but we just, you know, all the way we solve that is we call the IRS, we put a hold on that tax return and the refund, and then we paper file the actual return. And that takes about six months to a year, but it over, you know, supersedes it. You can also go to the irs.gov and get a tax pin an individual pin that's mailed to you every single year that's six digits it's specific to you if you're ever worried about your social security number getting stolen or out there which pretty much if you chopped at like target over the past 10 years it's out there somewhere you know any type of national chain they have been hacked to some extent um and they offer free identity protection but that irs.gov has that six digit pin that you can apply for and it's, it takes about 15 minutes, but you that's one way to ensure that your tax return is yours um, and no one else can file under your name because that's a very difficult pin to hack into. Um, other things that we tend to see, um, oh, these are very minimal, uh, but syndicated offshore monetized installment, these are all kind of very unique products that we, we see happening to really wealthy investors or to um, business owners, small business owners, but it's rare. Uh, virtual currency, I know everyone in this room has Bitcoin, um, but you actually may have it coming for you. If you have a financial advisor who manages your stock portfolio, the SEC just approved an ETF that has Bitcoin. First time ever. Um, ETFs are those just those funds that are pretty cheap, operating expenses ex and expense ratio, and they can put Bitcoin in it now. Um, so you actually may see Bitcoin in your future in some type of your mutual funds or uh, stock portfolios. Uh, the big thing in this is if you do have it or if 
you think you have it, all you do is you mark yes on your 1040 form um, that you do own some type of virtual currency, that's all. Um, there was a court case a few months ago, Jared versus US. He tried to argue that you know all the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency that he was generating at home was not actually reportable as income and it wasn't property that he was generating and the IRS just, nope, sorry, you're done. Tax court immediately said, you know, you lost. This is not even applicable as an argument. Um, that was a nice try. All right, California. Um, we, in this state, we have our own tax rules. We don't abide by the IRS federal rules. So everything has to be different naturally. Um, to, uh, to clear up a little bit first, there is no wealth tax yet, um, and there's no long-term care insurance yet. Those are two areas that commonly get asked. Um, One-time penalty abatement, this was new in 22, where California will allow you to abate any type of one-time late filing or payment penalties, one time in your life. Um, IRS has a different protocol and it allows it more often um, but this was a nice little change to see from California that at least, you know, you, you mess up one time, you get, you get a get out of jail free card. Individual healthcare mandate, that's still in play. And those are the penalties in case you don't want to go without insurance. This is not on federal anymore. Um, Cal Savers in California, there's a big push for retirement plans and the this is gonna increase over the years. So if you are still working by 2025, you're gonna to have to have some type of plan in play. Um, and AB 150 is that law that helped small business owners get around that salt tax limitation or anyone with alternative investments that can take advantage of it. Um, I got this question actually this week. Um, and so I, I decided to cover it because I was learning stuff alongside all of you. Um, so if you retire outside of California, just, you know, trying to get out of uh, this state into lower income or no income uh, states, the income that you earned while here in California, but you take out out of state is not taxed by California. And so the most, it, the uh, most famous example right now per the news is Shohei Itani, who's deferring his income for the next 10 years. Um, he can move out of California when he starts getting that deferred compensation and go move to Florida and pay zero in state tax on that money. Um, and so you see that with a lot of our executives too, with non-qualified deferred comp plans where they defer their compensation until years later, they'll move to a zero income tax state and don't have to pay state tax on that income. Uh, remote workers, if you're a W-2 employee, you're working for a California-based company and you're like, you know what, I wanna move to Washington. Same job, I, I do it from my computer. Um, California, no, you're no longer subject to California income tax if you're no longer a resident here, but you're working as a W-2 employee for the same company. It's kind of nice. However, if you became a 1099 contractor, there are sourcing rules that come into play and suddenly you're subject to California tax. Um, so yeah, for 2024, um, my accounting firm is now based out of Texas and California because of this, so there you go. Um, but it's just a small change on the employer side, but just realize that there is that benefit, but the dichotomy between the rule between W-2 and 1099 is, is quite interesting how that, there's that differentiation in the law. Uh, California is a community property state. Hopefully you realize this where community property earned income is 50-50 unless you have some type of agreement or pre or post nup. Um, I got this question yesterday uh, where a client just got married and his wife is going to file his own her, her own return um, with her own income that she's earned over the entire year. I'm like, it, it, it doesn't work that way. It, your community property, do, if you don't have an agreement, it's split. And we often on um, split returns, I think we get audited on those about 50% of the time. 
and you always have to show the W-2s and how you split it 50-50 and everything else. So the IRS is getting um, it just, they're, they're narrowing down on this one quite a bit. And I was, I was on a long conversation with two of the agents on an audit and they just admitted, they were just exasperated. They're like, we hate split returns. And I'm like, I, I get it, you know, <laughs> we, we do too. Um, but it is a point if you do split a return, realize you have to abide by the community property state laws and under situations where um, two spouses are living in two separate states that are community and non-community, that's a, an incredibly interesting return um, that you do need professional help with. Uh, property, this, well, we're in California, so might as well cover some property. Uh, the mansion tax is in full play right now, um, where if you sell a property, which is residential investment, anything across the board above 5 million, you have this extra kicker tax. This is getting adopted by several cities across the US as well, not, not the 4%, but something similar in terms of its nature. Um, and so looking at, I was looking at a graph this week on the mansion tax and you saw everyone selling homes above 5 million through March and then after March it just dived. I mean it just decimated the entire sale market for property above 5 million. Um, and the amount of income that LA expected was I think 900 million from this tax over the first year and they got maybe 130 or so if I remember correctly. So it's not quite working out the way they thought it would. We'll see what happens. Um, new this year, if you have a short term rental, um, so a lot of our clients have like ski condos and mammoth um, or Tahoe, or you have like a little beach bungalow or something that you rent out to Airbnb, VRBO, that sort of thing. You have to submit a property, personal property tax form, and most likely LA already emailed or sent you a letter about this if you do have a short term rental. Uh, but it's just claiming your personal property like, you know, couches, beds, furniture, and so LA gets a little bit of tax money additional. Uh, Prop 19, so we had a few changes. Um, this was passed in 2020, which limited the amount of property tax relief that you can give to, uh, pass on to your heirs. And now the way this works is a receiving child or grandchild needs to use this residence as their principal residence within one year. So they have to move into the house in order to get the property transfer up to $1 million in assessed value. Anything above that is according to fair market value. So you get the $1 million transfer and basis, and then anything above that is based on fair market value, what it should be. Um, this is indexed for inflation finally. So now it's like 1.02 million or so. Um, so a little bit amount and um, it doesn't apply to anything wrapped into a corporate entity or a revocable trust. Um, but like, you know, the electric vehicle, no limit on homes for, you know, you can have as many homes as you want to and transfer it over, which is nice. Um, something that's really nice about prop 19 is if 55 years or older or severely or permanently disabled or victim of natural disasters can transfer their property tax basis to a replacement property and again it's you have that lower fair market value it's not the 1 million cap but it's capped to the value of your property that you give up you can transfer that to the new property and if you actually buy a bigger house or a more expensive home, then it's just the offset, the difference in fair market value. You get the basis transferred over and then the offset above that. And that's allowed up to three times with that Proposition 19, unless you're a victim of disasters, which I really hope you haven't gone through three or more disasters in your lifetime. That, you know, you deserve that transfer in that scenario. Um, so, Whenever, uh, I get this question a lot on property tax valuation. I got it a few days ago, actually. Um, should you argue it or should you hire a consultant to argue for a lower threshold? And this is one case example where, you know, there is some risk to arguing it where the Marina Center, um, they bought a shopping center for a hundred million bucks. 
the assessor came in and said, okay, it's worth about 94. They gave him a slight discount, but they were greedy. They thought it was only worth 48 million. And the court case brought in assessors to really assess the property and found out, oh, our mistake, it's actually worth 113 million going forward. Um, so they took a hit, they took a big hit. Um, so sometimes greed doesn't work in your favor. Uh, this is filing requirements. Um, you must file under these scenarios. Um, the married filing separate is an interesting one where if your gross income is above $5, um, I've never seen an audit on that one before, but, um, but $400 self-employment income, or if your income's above the standard deduction, you have to file. Um, you also, if you receive any HSA or MSA distributions, that's the health savings account. Um, and so we, we see that more popular nowadays where a lot of people get that HSA because it is a great tool for saving money because it can, you get the deduction when you contribute to an HSA and it grows tax-free. And then 20, 30 years down the road, you can submit co-pays and uh, prescriptions and medical costs for receipts that you collected today submit them 20, 30 years down the road and get reimbursements for that amount as your money grew tax-free in this account. Um, so if you have an HSA, it, it's actually a really good thing if you have the, uh, you know, the stamina and the foresight to wait on seeking out these reimbursements. It, it's a good way to save some money. And the other item is a nanny tax. Uh, so if you pay someone in your household above 2600 you should be filing a Schedule H or payroll. You should be running payroll on these people that work in your household, whether it's healthcare, maids, drivers, gardeners, babysitters, et cetera. Um, so you should have some payroll account for those people. And it's, it's pretty easy to set up, um, but the IRS just wants to make sure they're getting FICA Medicare um, from this income. Uh, dependents, for those who have dependents, this is related to filing requirements for a dependent, a child, if they make this earned income or unearned income, unearned income being from uh, stock accounts, 1099s, interest income, if you built a, um, an account for them where they're earning this unearned income. Earned income is a job, W-2 or 1099. And tax returns begin, well, unless Carol's right on the whole shutdown thing, um, January 29th. Um, we haven't had a normal tax season in about three, four years. So we're, we're not optimistic that this year is gonna be normal. Um, but January 29th is when you can submit them and paper returns just take longer to process and may not be the safer option. You can free file on IRS and California um, if your income is below 79,000. California has a laundry list of requirements that you need to meet as well to free file. So be careful before you do that, just make sure you do qualify. And you do have a normal filing deadline of April 15th, unless you're an extended um, as of right now. Uh, PDFs, we have some handouts, and these are things that we give our clients on questions that they need to pre-fill out before they see us to make sure that we capture all the changes and deductions and potential um, optimizations that we can do for the tax return. And you can request from Sandy for electronic copies if you would like. Um, but it's, it's something to, if you're not receiving this from your tax preparer or if you're doing it on your own, these are just a good checklist to go by to make sure you have everything. Um, that's a little fun one. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. If you make money, you have to pay tax and it's part of the benefit, you know, if you can believe that. Um, questions?
share the vision with you. Yeah, yeah. But the, uh, it is possible for abortion. No, but you can if it's a QCD, the income yeah. is fully tax exempt. The, in the, the income, income that we generate. The income they get paid. Yeah, yeah. It's fully tax exempt. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Different than the, the one that I talked about. Yeah, which yeah. Which is only partially tax exempt. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's rare. Okay. All right, so one question on the QCD on annuity income payments. They are subject to taxation, um, but you have to look at um, when you do go into that arrangement with a 501c, you have to look at the, it's a pretty thick document that they generate um, to see which portion is taxable, which portion is non-taxable, which portion is deductible. It, it's it's quite complex. Just you have to look through that document to make sure that you are capturing the taxable portion each year. Um, the cap on mortgage interest. It depends when you bought your house. Um, if you bought your house prior to December 29th, 2017, um, 28th, 29th or so. Um, then the cap for federal is $750,000 for a married filing joint. Um, for married, um, if you bought your house after, sorry, that's after, if you bought it before, your cap is $1 million plus $100,000 of uh, additional equity line interest and things like that for house improvements. Um, California, it still remained the same at $1.1 total. Uh, the mansion tax, that was kind of in one of those present, it's like four and a half percent or 5%, depending on the value of the home. Um, yeah, five and a half percent, sorry, 4% on property above 5 million and 5.5% on above 10 million. So you see a lot of realtors listing homes at 4.99% or 4.99 million to try to get around it. Um, and this one is a question on the 3.8% net in, uh, investment interest tax. If you buy another home after selling your house, you're always subject to it. Unfortunately, it doesn't go away. Um, oh, do you have any? Yes. Here's a few more questions. Sorry. Switch my glasses here. On charitable donations, if you receive a product or service with a donation, can you deduct it? So you can only deduct to the extent, the excess of what the value you receive. So if you, you know, a lot of people obviously go to these um, fundraisers and they, you know, bid for tickets and say, let's just say the your bid was a thousand dollars, but you received tickets of eight hundred dollars. You can only deduct two hundred dollars as a donation. Um, can I still file head of household on my twenty three return if my daughter turned twenty four during the year? Um, not unless she's disabled, permanently disabled, uh, is when that comes into play. Um, is remodeling cost deductible on a primary home? Um, no. You cannot deduct any anything that you work on on your primary home, but you want to keep track of that so that when you do sell it, you can add that to the cost of your home. Uh, uh, file Mary filing joint for many years. Can I switch to filing as a single filer? No, if you're married, you either have to file as joint or uh, separate. Right. Losses in car accident, are they deductible minus what was received by insurance? Um, no longer. That was eliminated in 2017 on losses and theft deductions and things like that. They have to be connected to a federal disaster, unfortunately. Unless you can justify that was in the course of business, that's another situation on a business return. What part of payments for senior housing can be deductible? So again, that's that's a pretty tricky one. You need to talk to 
the people at the senior housing. Some facilities will actually break it down for you and say how much is related to medical versus just the rent of the place. So um, again, it's, it's one of those gray areas that you have to get more in depth with, with your advisor and your whoever um, the senior housing is. And nanny tax, what about pool services um, or contractors? So if you're paying a business, no, you don't have to fill out a nanny tax form or anything like that. Um, but if you're paying John Smith to do something directly to him and you're paying over that $2,600 threshold per year, technically that does qualify for the household employment scenario where you have to fill out the payroll form and everything else. So it's whether you're paying them as a business or as an individual where that difference comes into play. In regard to rent, what is considered active versus passive income? So again, that's a pretty in-depth tax concept, whether you are considered passive. So there's three different levels, passive, active, and real estate professional. So real estate professional basically is people that have licenses, that's their main career, you know, that's all they do. And there's there's very there's a lot of different tests that you have to do to qualify as a real estate professional. And you know, the same true is with active and passive. So um, it's a little bit more in depth that we're today. Um. Yeah, I made a donation for Girl Scout cookies above 250. Does the acknowledgement of payment count as the written receipt or written letter? Technically not, honestly. The receipt doesn't work. It has to be a letter saying no goods or services were exchanged for this donation. And apparently in this scenario, you got cookies. So <laughs> it, it doesn't work. Um, but they're good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Medicare, uh, Medicare premium for 2024 um, based on 2023 AGI, but I haven't filed yet. They actually look at two years ago. So um, if you haven't filed yet, it doesn't matter. They look at two years ago. This is fun going back and forth with the microphone. <laughs> uh, we had a leak in our house in December of 22. Insurance paid for most of it. Do we need to keep records um, of the total amount we pay, that we paid? Yes. Um, because you can, if you do eventually sell that house, and eventually it's going to pass on, um, you're going to have to establish the basis of that house, including repairs that you've made to that house to avoid any capital gains tax in the future. Um, so always keep records. Uh, I inherited property from my parents two years ago and sold it last year. Are capital gains required to be reported on the sale since it was inherited. Yes, if you do have a gain on it, you are reported, you are required because you now own, you owned that property. Um, but this gets kind of into estate taxes, but don't forget when you inherited that property, you may have got what's called a step up in basis. So the gain should be very minimal because when you inherited, there's a high likelihood that your new cost was the value when you inherited it. So, gets a bit technical and it has a lot to do with estate taxes, but you do have to report it um, on your return. Uh, working remotely from home for a company in New Jersey. Um, and I can't uh, read the rest of it, uh, but you have to see what document they provide you. I've, I have a few, few clients who actually have this scenario exactly in New Jersey. Um, they live here permanently, but they get a W-2 from New Jersey and they just haven't changed their state uh, filing code. And so I have to file a return for them in New Jersey and take credit for it in California for that scenario. Uh, but if you do work remotely for companies, assuming it's a W-2, not as a 1099, that you have to you have to look at the W-2 document and ensure you file accordingly for that state that it claims that you're working in at that time. Because you do have a lot of companies where they just won't produce a W-2 for California. They just don't know the rules. Um, or they you're flying out there once in a while and they think that you're actually working in that state. That's under a different scenario where it's different tax rules apply. 
Um, so just another question on the Medicare premium, and it is for 2024, it is based on two years ago. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Prop 19, generational property transfer relief. How does it apply to property and living trusts, the same as it is in your individual? Um, it doesn't apply to things that are in corporations like LLCs or in irrevo uh, irrevocable trusts. And does all beneficiary need to take it as a prince, uh, principal residence to get the $1 million relief? Yes, you have to have the uh, beneficiary move into the house within one year to get that $1 million relief amount. Or if they move out, another sibling has to move in there right after them. It has to stay in the family essentially for it to qualify and continue to qualify for. If I hire a caregiver for my husband, is it deductible? And it depends what that caregiver is doing. So basically the medical expense rules depend on you know, what that person is able to do on their own versus they call it DL, I believe they call it DLA, daily living activities. So if they're not able to do that and that's what the caregiver is for, then it's considered a medical expense. Oh. And Mitchell, we're supposed to ask you for questions. Mitchell. Oh. All right, we'll come back to Mitchell. Okay. Oh, there um, we go. Is pay on death benefits considered inheritance? Pay on death benefits. Um, oh, yeah, so, no, yeah. yeah, so so it, it is an inheritance, um, but it's only the, generally, it's only the income that'll be taxable. Yeah. Okay, uh, what is considered an employer Roth IRA? Uh, and then it has page 29. Page 20, employer Roth IRA. The, the retire, sorry. Um, if, if you have a retirement account, you have the option between like a standard 401k, 403b, there are a lot of different uh, retirement plans out there. Um, and you have the option for a Roth, employer Roth account as well, which is taking after tax money and putting it into a Roth account. Um, so the whole like 22,500, which we were limited to last year as the employee portion could go directly into a Roth account and become you don't get the deduction today, you you know, but this money does grow tax free and you get flexibility over taking it out as an RMD in the future, no requirement to take it at all. Um, but that's a tax strategy point. Do you take the deduction now or do you push it off into the future? And there are opinions both ways on that one, which is better. So, um, yeah, so the employer has to select that option, and a lot of plans don't actually offer that type of plan. A lot of them just go with a standard 401k or a SEP or something like that. So they are becoming more and more popular. You just don't see a lot of people taking advantage of it in a standard W-2 position. Uh, let's see. Um, I guess this one came on Zoom. My mom and I will receive my late dad's inheritance from a foreign country where all taxes have been paid to that country's income. Uh, we have clearance to bring in the funds. When, when, we receive, when we receive it here in our bank, do we have to report it to the IRS or do we have to file an income tax return for the money we bring into the U.S. next year? Who has... When we invest that money here and make any interest amount, then we file the income tax on that amount. Um, oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I believe that when you, if you already paid taxes in that foreign country and you're just bringing over the net cash, you don't report that as income, but there are specific forms when you do bring over money from a foreign country. And I believe it's form 3520, but you should definitely consult with someone on that. Get in touch. Yeah, these are getting very specific. I love it. Um, give to 
don't know what that means. I'm trying to figure it out. Um, is emergency transportation membership tax deductible for ground and air ambulance? Um, if you'd have to connect it to a medical, I believe, and then it would be subject to this 7.5% AGI limitation as well. Um, so yeah, I, I can, I'd actually take it as a deduction, to be honest. I, I don't see any issues with that. Um, but it'd be Schedule A, and it would be limited to that 7.5%. Um, one of the questions, or one of the said uh, pros and cons of setting up a 529 plan. So, I mean, that again, that kind of gets in depth, but basically the whole idea with the 529 plan is you're able to set this up for education and it is a gift, so there are no deductions, uh, but that money continues to grow in the 529 plan for the beneficiary. Uh, are receipts required for upgrades, modifications made to your house required? Um, yeah, that's best to keep the invoices and receipts a record of your costs um, somewhere just in case you do go under audit. Um, and the audit, actually, it's, I, I don't know if you all saw, but like there was a news article yesterday of 520 million that the IRS clawed back from millionaires. Um, an audit, it, it's not scary, you know, to go through it. Um, it's actually more entertaining for us to kind of um, <laughs> go through it all. Uh, but the the audits, you know, they, they tend to attack people of higher income because the cost versus benefit is actually tangible when your income goes above like two fifty five hundred thousand um, dollars But th the real impact of an audit is a secondary effect. The secondary effect being, you know, the fear that it propagates among a community of people like, oh God, I'm going to be audited. I need to make sure that this, I, I do this completely correct. Um, that's really the impact of an audit that you should be aware of. Um, obviously, you, you know, you want to do your tax return correctly, but don't don't fear an audit. It's it's not they're not coming at you with pitchforks. So one thing I do want to mention and kind of along that lines is that, you know, as many of you know, California is pretty aggressive with their taxes. Um, and they'll send someone a notice saying they owe all these California taxes for almost no reason at all. So I have clients where the um, kids are in California and they get all the mail because they're taking care of their parents who are in another state. I'm sorry, the kids are in another state, but their parents are in California. So I have a client who's in Missouri and her, her mother was in California. She gets all the mail because she handles all of the finances and whatnot. So she got a notice that her um, that she should be filing California taxes. So it's really important to watch out for that. I had another client who dad, who, whose dad lived in Texas and he had kind of co-signed on the, the home in California for his daughter. And he got a tax notice saying that he owed California taxes. And they just look at all of the income that he earned from the 1099s or W-2 and assess this tax. So, you know, as I said, they're, they're pretty aggressive about things like that. So, you know, my mother-in-law lives in New York and, um, you know, now we're getting all her mail because we're taking care of her. She's still in New York. And I'm, I have a feeling that I'm going to get a notice for her saying that she needs to file California taxes. So, you know, there's ways around it, but it does get a bit frustrating. I'm not sure on these either. Is there any more online, Mitchell, or are we okay? Yes. Uh, what is considered passive income? Um like dividends, interest income, uh, real estate often, as long as you're not actively managing. Um, it, it goes to, it, essentially the definition is, are you actively generating this income or are you passively doing it? Passive being you don't really have a management or a day-to-day -day role in generating that income. So you're getting a limited member K-1, you're getting a 1099 from a bank or brokerage firm. Uh, you're doing, you're getting income, but not working day to day for it. Um, this is a gift tax question. If I change title of my bank account to joint Tennessee, adding my daughter, do I need to file a gift tax return? 
Um, if I file it two years later, are there any penalties? If she is going to be an owner of the account, then yes, I do believe that you need to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon and Carol. Let's give them a big round of applause. We're running out of time, so I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Please feel free to email me. I'll put the, my email address up here again. And um, I will uh, explore, you know, Carol and Brandon will um, probably be willing to provide an answer. So if you emailed me directly, I knew, know who to get it back to. So again, apologies for not getting to all of the questions, but what a fabulous presentation and we are so appreciative of your time and expertise. And I forgot to mention at the beginning, Carol is our newest member of the Professional Advisory Council. So she joined us last week. So we're, we're really glad that uh, she jumped right in and was willing to, to help present today. Um, I do also like to mention that Torrance Memorial sends charitable donation acknowledgement letters for every gift we receive, whether it's $5 or $500,000. So, um, you know, that, that is something that we are always make, giving attention to, to be sure that people uh, have the documents they need and just know how much we appreciate your support. So do know that is the case. Um, I think the scam slide that Brand, Brandon showed is so important. So do pay attention to that. I hear too many stories of people being taken advantage of. So that, that was, thank you for including that, Brandon. That's a really important slide. And also uh, the, the handouts, the tax interview um, handouts Brandon mentioned, there are some copies on the back table. So um, feel free to, to take those on your way out and I'm happy to send the PDF too if you want. You can just email me for that. I also wanted to mention Craig Leach, our president and CEO, who was with Torrance Memorial for 40 years. He retired October 31st last year. There, is a, there are a couple publications back there that tell great stories and um, we, we wanted to honor him. Uh, so those are available for the taking also. And the other thing that uh, is happening is the Lundquist who have their name on our emergency department, they have uh, wanted, want to change the name. And so we'll be putting up a new sign that says Lundquist Leach Emergency Department. So that was something they wanted to do to honor Craig's service and uh, all of his great work for Torrance Memorial. So we, there might be a couple additional handouts on the back table if you um, feel free to take those. Um, the evaluation form, please do take a minute to fill that out. I do pay attention to what you write on there. And if you wanna get on our email distribution list, um, uh, be sure to make a note of that and we'll add your email address to that. We did record today's seminar and it will be posted on our website. Anybody who I have the email address for, I will send that out in uh, sometime next week after Mitchell is able to uh, get it in the right format and get it posted. So watch for that email and then you can share that with others who you think might benefit from watching that recording at their convenience. So our next two lectures, the next one is on March 9. It's IRA and 401k RMD planning to protect your retirement assets. You all have a flyer about that. Our presenters are Christian Cordoba and Nancy Gregg. We'll be right here again in this room. There's a sign up sheet in the back if you wanna sign up for it now. And then in, on May 11, we'll have our uh, favorite social savvy social security planning. Kristen Rigg is uh, an expert in that. And so she'll be presenting along with Greg Schill on in, in May. So, all right, thank you so much for coming today. We really appreciate your attendance and participation. Have a great rest of the weekend. Oh, and uh, our PAC members are around if you have questions. Brandon and Carol will be down here. Abby and Matt are both still here and they're both in the real estate world. So feel free to 